on that. Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? I'm doing okay. Yeah? I, I just learned... I'm going to share this with the audience. All right. Um, I just learned that uh, that Liberty Larry's phone does not respect his voice. Oh, yeah. No, you're right about that. <laughs> Man, I'd be telling that thing what to do, and they'd be doing all kinds of crazy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, apparently, he does not command respect from his phone. Nope. That's a, that's an unfortunate situation. It seems. It, it is. Yeah. I I set my phone to not listen to me. Of course, it does anyway. Oh yeah. Um, but I try my best to limit its eavesdropping. Yeah, yeah, that's smart. Yeah, I also like to leave it in the other room. <laughs> <laughs> that's also smart if you yeah. don't want it eavesdropping. <laughs> yeah. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of social interaction, and uh, so I guess uh, like a, a it it has access to a significant part of the social interaction that I have. Right. Yeah. Um, it listened to me uh, debate economics mostly for like an hour and a half on the phone with a friend of mine last night. So, yeah. so always a good debate to have. Yeah. Um, except that if anybody's getting on a list after that, it's me, not him. <laughs> yeah, right. Because <laughs> <laughs> he, he was decidedly pro-government and I'm decidedly against it. Yeah. So, oh well. Such so, is life. So did you hear that um, Biden must have listened to our last podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Why? So, why is because that? Because he's um, basically pardoned a ton of people for marijuana. You mean fentanyl? No, no, no. Oh. He, he didn't go that far. So, so apparently we're ratcheting up one drug and ratcheting down another. Uh, baby yeah. steps, I guess. Yeah. I mean, hey. It's exciting news. I was excited to hear about it yesterday. I mean, I, there's plenty of people who've suffered way too much over a drug that mm -hmm. does more help than harm, at least in my mind. Yeah, I think that's debatable, but um, it's certainly not that dangerous. Yeah, it's certainly um, not dangerous. And, you know, the truth is that our position, it doesn't matter. <laughs> well, yeah, and exactly. Yeah. I mean, if... I mean, I would prefer he did that with all drugs, yeah. but I mean, that's, we're a long way from that. Yeah. You remember when, uh, when Gary Johnson pulled up short on that one? He did. Yeah. That, yeah. Was, that was unfortunate. One of the many disappointments <laughs> Yeah, <no. laughs> from well, that presidential candidate. And it just, it, it's, it's a weird one though, because it does it, like in some ways it also fed into the, um, the, uh, stereotype of libertarians that we just want, um, we just want legalized weed and yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, and it, that, that really is a position. You really can't <laughs> Bitcoin and legalized weed. Is that, <laughs> that's <laughs> well, all we're interested. That's in. all we're interested in. <laughs> no, but the, the drug thing in general, it's really hard to just pick one and not the other. And, yeah. and I feel the same way about alcohol. And I've said it for years, you know, mm -hmm. alcohol is perfectly legal. And it's, to me, it's more dangerous than marijuana is. Yeah. Well, um, and cigarettes too. Same thing with cigarettes. Although there is kind of a push to... There is a push to ban that, Prohibit too. cigarettes. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, during COVID, uh, I don't know how long that this persisted, but um, during COVID, South Africa uh, outlawed alcohol and tobacco. Did they really? Yeah. Um, because the it was something like, you know, it got people out of their houses when they wanted them to stay home and... Yeah. You know, things like this. I, I can't remember exactly what the reasoning was. And uh, you may be surprised to find out that very quickly. Um, <laughs> they a, started turning that, rolling that back? <laughs> that, well, a black market developed oh, in alcohol and tobacco. I bet. <laughs> I can and uh, yeah, so then, then the government, um, I don't know, I didn't track this for very long because I was just like, ah, oh, stupid. Yeah. Um, but uh, then the, the government was saying that the, that they were surprised at how quickly um, these black market businesses had set up shop and started distributing products and that it would take them years to, um, to tear down these illicit businesses that had uh, appeared had almost up. overnight. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> well, um, and the amazing thing is, is, okay, so you can say that, oh, yeah, it's gonna, this, all, this, all this infrastructure popped up so quick, we're, it's mm -hmm. going to take us years to root this out. Mm -hmm. And the truth is that's not the case at all. Because once you legalize everything again, right. they disband almost immediately. 
exactly. Yeah, they become legitimate businesses that you don't have to root out. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, which was my whole point with the fentanyl on the last podcast is mm-hmm. that's, I mean, if you want to, this is a real problem. I'm not debating that it's not a real problem. If you mm-hmm. want to fix it, the easiest way is to just decriminalize it. Like, I, I know that's a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow, but it is the truth. Yeah. Yeah, and you um, eliminate a bunch of the problems that go along with it, uh, because in all of these drugs, um, one of your biggest issues is issues that revolve around black markets. Exactly. Um, And so if you have an open market, a freed market, um, then you eliminate a lot of uh, violence that goes along with it. Yeah. Uh, Violence and fraud and theft and Lots of other things. Yeah. Um, things that are real crimes. Exactly. <laughs> so. Um, so, yeah, well, I mean, it's a, it's a step. I, uh, I don't know the details on this. So. Yeah. I mean, this, I, I don't know a whole lot other than he um, pardoned a bunch of people who were either in jail or had, um, or had, or had the records expunged, people who had gotten out but still mm-hmm. had it on their record, mm-hmm. like a bunch of that. And um and he's encouraging the governors to do the same at the, on the state level. Okay. So he can only do that federally. Right. Um. So he's. It is in, a federal crime, though. Yeah. Is it not so? I'm assuming so. I don't know, but um, <laughs> pretty much everything is a federal crime these yeah. days. So. Well, the ones. So uh, the way I understood it is the people who were charged federally is who he had an impact on. Right. And now he's asking the governors to follow suit, um, and do the same thing on you know, on each state level. Okay. So, now, if he would just do the same for um, Julian Assange and for uh, Edward Snowden. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> man, I would actually say that uh, Biden's done a pretty good job so far. I if he was going to say, yeah, like, <laughs> that would definitely be a step. Would that be will, Would that be enough to get you to vote for him in the next election? No. No, still not. not <laughs> no, he would have done everything I, I thought that he might do that well, I wouldn't have done. I, I will tell you on the... Um, shows last night that was that was really where the coverage revolved around was mm-hmm. how much this is going to impact the midterms yeah and how this is oh, a, yeah a well i mean that was to, the purpose of it right i'm sure it was um at least as far as the timing of it mm-hmm. um i mean they tried to play it off in the coverage as oh well he's been working on this behind the scenes for a while and now is when and it what kinda... they were doing was carefully calculating when they could uh, <laughs> announce this <laughs> that it would have the greatest impact on the midterm elections yeah absolutely that's... So right. there, there's no question that's what's going on, but well, um, ah, you know what I like, I, I should have taken some notes, um, about the, uh, Julian Assange thing. We could have talked about that. I, well, I didn't know that this was going to come up either. Yeah. So, I, you know, um, that is an important topic though, in terms of, uh, pardons yeah. that could and should be done. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, just uh, as a, just, uh, like a, very quick commentary on that. Um, it seems to me that people don't really understand how much how much of an infringement um, prosecuting Julian Assange is. Yeah. Because it really is talking about whether um, whether publishers can publish information that is harmful to the government. That's really what the question is. Yeah. Um, can, uh, publishers publish, um, (laughs) crimes committed by the government, information about crimes committed by the government that is in the public interest if the government doesn't want that information published? Well, that's the question. And the whole point of having an independent media was to be to do exactly that. that. (laughs) Exactly. Um, and unfortunately, I think we've gotten the answer to that through Assange. Is that you can't do that. Like, yeah. I mean, you can at your own peril, mm-hmm. um, and you have to be kind of careful. Yeah. Well, and Snowden is a is a um, another case that's that's similar. Now, um, I'm sure that Snowden made some commitments to keep information secret that he was that, that was shared with him. Yeah. Um, but the more important vow that he made or oath that he took was to the constitution of the United States. Yeah. And that supersedes any commitment that he made to the agency itself. And it should be the same way for anybody in the mm-hmm. position for the military. I right. Mean, you're, you're. And the, intelligence agencies. He was CIA contractor, oh, yeah, right? Yeah. So. I mean, absolutely. I mean, the, your, your commitment to your 
the I don't want to say well being, but the your loyalty to your country should come before any military or anything like that. Yeah, and the the Constitution is supposed to be the law of the land and will should supersede any all else. Yeah, any yeah. other. Um, commitments that you make to your employer even if it's or probably especially if it's the federal government well snowden's now a citizen of russia isn't he i heard something saying that he had gotten full russian citizenship yeah um and just uh in in case people aren't aware um the obama government actually trapped him in moscow they revoked his passport while he was in the air yeah. Um, on his way to Moscow, on his way, it was supposed to be a connecting flight to South America. Oh, is that where he was heading? Yeah, uh, I think so. I'm pretty sure. I, I can't remember which country. It was like Argentina or somewhere, but yeah. um, Bolivia, I don't know. Bolivia seems like a good one. That, it, At any rate, it was some South American country I'm pretty sure that he was on his way to, and his passport was revoked in the air. Um, so he was he was trapped in Russia, wow. and I'm sure that that was again Not very calculated. By accident, yeah. Um, so of all could, the places that we could like land this guy and stick him, yeah. The the country that we're having the that we're antagonizing the most, well, it's vilifying about the most. vilifying the most, right? Yeah. So it makes him, you know, you can start uh, subtly suggesting that he's a Russian spy. Yeah, yeah. Instead of a patriot. Yeah. Absolutely. Which he clearly is, by the way. Yeah. Patriot, that is. Yeah, not spy. <laughs> not spy. Yeah. I mean he was a spy, but he was a he was an American spy. Yeah. He was one of the good guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I man, it's hard to say that. Cause if <clears throat> if I don't have this mixed up, he was a um working for the CIA and contracted out to the NSA. Isn't that is that his I, I'm not what sure. His I don't thing know. Was? I'm I'm pretty sure I can't keep all those yeah. things straight, but um not if I hadn't recently looked at it anyway. Yeah. Like, you know, the brain's got... Only so much Got hurt. some holes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but, uh, yeah, I think uh, that you said that what we needed to do after the last one, um, and I, I have been challenged in places about my crazy belief that the U.S. might have been involved in the um, sabotage of the Nord Stream pipelines. Yeah. And, uh, the, you know, baseless claims and so so you've heard you've heard that be said before to you then yeah, <laughs> yes <laughs> baseless conspiracy theory claims that the u.s would have been involved in which is just sabotaging Nord Stream insane too. like i just can't wrap my head around even thinking that mm-hmm. so um yeah i uh you said that i needed to pull the clips i didn't have time to look last time i didn't really have time to this time i was like pulling them when, when gary arrived here, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but uh anyway i did manage to at least get a couple of clips um so that you can hear what um what some american f- officials had to say yeah and uh let's start with the man himself the the big guy the big guy yes uh, <laughs> joe biden and what he had to say in february um about Nord Stream 2 after of yeah. course um he he had actually uh, r- lifted the sanctions on Nord Stream two because it became clear that it was going to get finished. Yeah, um, Trump had uh, placed sanctions on it. Uh, I think the original sanctions may have been placed by Obama. Probably because um, that's when construction would have started. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, Trump uh, placed additional sanctions and was even sanctioning European companies that were working on the pipeline. Yeah. Um, that didn't get a lot of press because it was uh, count- It was contrary to the narrative that that Trump was a Russian agent. <laughs> um, right. So I, I I don't think that it really got a lot of press at the time. But anyway, uh, Biden came into office and actually lifted the sanctions um, because the the pipeline was essentially done already, yeah. but then started pushing, putting pressure on the German government not to open not the pipeline. Not to use it, yeah. yeah. Uh, which they haven't, yeah. ever. Yeah. Um, but this is what Biden had to say about the pipeline in uh, February. Here we go. All right. Let me answer the first question first. If, if, uh, if Russia invades, uh, that means tanks or troops crossing the, uh, the, the border of Ukraine. Again, then uh, there will be uh, we there will be no longer a Nord Stream two. We we will bring an end to it. What do you, what? How will you how will you do that exactly? Since the project 
and control of the project is within Germany's control. We will, uh, I promise you, we'll be able to do it. So there you have it from the big man. Yeah, big guy. <laughs> big, big guy, that's yeah. right. Big guy. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty clear, right? Yeah. Um, And just in case that's not enough, you know, because Biden says some crazy stuff. Well, sometimes. I was going to say, sometimes you just got to write off stuff Biden says. And I remember at the time that this was, that was kind of written off. Like, mm. I mean, you know, guy says crazy things. Like, <laughs> Yeah, but very close on the heels of this. Yeah. Um, also before the invasion, but very close on the heels of this. Uh, you have our old friend, Victoria Newland, Ooh. who, um, as you know, uh, was deeply involved in Ukraine during the Obama administration. Um, in fact, uh, she picked the government that was to take the place of the government that, um, the U S may or may not have overthrown in 2014. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, she's of course from the famous, uh, F the EU tape, but, yeah. um, the you know the real point to remember about that recording besides them naming the government that they were going to put in place 2 weeks later uh she and Jeffrey Piet um is that the the reason that she was saying F the EU is because the the EU wasn't moving fast enough to um i guess really to uh, instigate the coup yeah <laughs> Um, or, or at least to, uh, to move against Russia in a way that they were happy with. Yeah. So, um, and the, the government of Ukraine at that time, um, they had been, uh, being courted by both the EU and Russia and, um, they had a deal with the EU and when they actually showed up to sign the deal, a bunch of terms had been changed. Yeah. And so they abandoned that deal and went ahead and were moving forward with a deal with Russia. And that's when the coup happened. Yeah. Coincidentally. Imagine that. Yeah, coincidentally. <laughs> the totally organic yeah. grassroots coup. Yeah. Um, that uh, that the U.S. officials picked the replacement government for before it happened. Yeah. Coincidentally. Amazingly. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, uh, she was in a uh, congressional hearing, I think is where this was. Okay. Um, and, uh, and she had this to say about Nord Stream 2. All right. Um, with regard to Nord Stream 2, uh, we continue to have uh, very strong and clear conversations uh, with our German allies. And I want to be clear with you today. If Russia invades Ukraine... One way or another, Nord Stream 2 will not move forward. One way or the other. Yeah. <laughs> it, it looks like we got one way, and then they were like, ah, let's do the other two. <laughs> yeah, just in case. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> let's, let's solidify the position here. Exactly. Yeah. So. Um, now, you know, it's, it's possible that the U.S. didn't do this. I, I don't want to say definitively that the u.s and not just because you don't want to get our moth attack <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what the hell was that <laughs> okay he seems to have settled on the wall over there i'll have to take care of that soon <laughs> cats are not doing their job apparently yeah i think moths don't taste very good i haven't tried one myself but imagine they're kind of chalky yeah um the cats do like flying things though yeah. They, they particularly like leaping up in the air after stuff. So I don't know how this moth, he must just be very clever. Very Too clever. clever. Moth. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. <laughs> it's a bug. Yeah. Uh, of course he's in here while we're recording uh, this podcast. Right. No. Um, now I'm totally off track. What, what was I saying? <laughs> Come on, help me out. <laughs> no, we were, um, Nord Stream, and we didn't. Do, you were oh, saying yeah. we didn't. Do, it's not definitive that we did this, right? But, and and I would tend to agree. I do think it's likely, though. Yeah, um, I actually, I think that probably the most likely thing is that it was some other country with the U.S.'s help. Yeah, uh, Poland would be my pick in that case. Yeah, but um, didn't Poland have some stuff bombed too? I am not sure about I'm that. Not, I like, I, I heard up, a report yeah. that the um, that the pipeline coming from uh, Sweden, Norway, um, down there had been attacked as well, but I heard that somewhere and I have not found 
corroborating. Okay. Well, I reports. heard that somewhere so, too. So I, I mean, not, I, I, I didn't I, just take that from you. One of the source foreign sources that I follow had reported that. Yeah, I haven't seen that corroborated elsewhere in in the places where I look for this kind of information. So I'm not sure that that's um, that's true. Okay. And but I have uh, come across multiple sources that said that n- the Nord Stream two wasn't completely stopped. Um, oh, cause yeah. it's, it's, it's actually like multiple pipes running together. Yeah. Um, and apparently one of the pipes survived the attack and can still transfer gas. Yeah. Um, and the Russians are saying that the other three, I think, um, pipes that run, that run with it, uh, can be repaired, but I, I, I well, don't know how long that's true. And the, well, I was fixing to say the reports I had seen had said that they could be repaired, but it needed to be soon. Yeah, that it wasn't something that could be the longer they wait, the less likely. Yeah, they can. because now that they've been unpressurized, the salt water's getting in there, and the exactly. salt water will corrode the pipes. Exactly. So, um, but they need sanctions lifted to do that. Though. Right. So here we are. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I did think of another possibility. Um, this one's uh, this one's not totally unlikely, but it it. Hmm. I'm not sure what their operating capabilities in the Baltics is, and that would be Israel. Oh, yeah. Um, because Israel stands to gain, too. They have uh, big natural gas and um, and petroleum uh, reserves as well off their coast and in the Golan Heights that they occupy, Yeah, even though it's not technically theirs. Yeah. Um, so, and they, uh, you know, there's pipelines that run from the Middle East through the Caribbean into Europe as well. Yeah. So uh, they could stand to gain economically as well from these. And um, certainly they have the capability, their military has the capability on the whole. Yeah. I just don't know what kind of operating capability they have in the Baltic. Yeah. So um, that one, I'm, that one's just kind of like a, a side note. Yeah. I suppose. Yeah. But, but, but it is, it is certain that, that somebody, some country did this. Oh yeah. Like I mean it's <laughs> yeah, not it was not an accident. <laughs> yeah. It's it's clear that this wasn't something that just had this didn't occur naturally. <laughs> yeah. Um and it would require uh some pretty significant capabilities. Um this isn't like some diver with a stick of TNT or something. Yeah. It's, it just yeah. um it, it was coordinated obviously uh across multiple sections um and it was uh like a couple hundred uh pounds of explosive mass. Yeah. Or at least uh, like TNT equivalent. Yeah. So, um, I mean, it's a pretty significant attack. It would probably take a state sponsor to have done it. Yeah. And, and in fact, uh, pretty much everybody agrees on that. Yeah. That's that's. Now the idea again that Russia's did it has done it. I mean, you can't that, throw that, that out. Yeah, but that just seems like the conspiracy theory to well, me. Yeah. Um. Especially when the reason the reasons that they give is so that Russia can show that they have the ability to attack undersea targets um, outside of Russia or like you know push if this kind of thing. If that's the case, though, wouldn't they admit that they did it? Yeah, it seems like they would claim it if that was yeah. the case. Like we attacked our own pipeline to show you that, that we can blow up pipelines. Yes, <laughs> in several hundred feet of water. Yeah, exactly. Or meters or whatever. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so uh, it, it does seem weird that they would do it to make a statement, but then not tell anybody. Yeah, that's that's odd. There's a contradiction there. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, our Secretary of State, uh, Anthony Blinken, um, he was also talking about these pipelines recently. Yeah. And of course, what he was saying is he was um, condemning this uh, brazen terrorist attack on a NATO country's infrastructure, vital energy infrastructure. Yeah. No, that's not what he was saying at all. Oh, that's not what he was saying? No. I was like, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I was all with you. I was that's, like, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's what you would expect of the um, U.S. Secretary of State in this kind of situation where there was an obvious terrorist attack on um, an, on an ally's uh, critical energy infrastructure. And, and I think that is a point worth kind of emphasizing is that, that this is critical infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, these people need this gas to get through the winter. Yeah. Yeah. Like, we'll talk about this a little bit more. We talked about it some last time. We'll talk about it a little bit more um, after I play you what he actually said. All right, let's hear it. This is also a tremendous opportunity, opportunity to once and for all remove the dependence 
on Russian energy, and thus to take away from uh, Vladimir Putin the weaponization of energy as a means of advancing uh, his uh, imperial designs. Uh, that's very significant. Well, okay. Well, uh, then. <laughs> well, let me start off with the ad hominem. Yeah. Um, because I hate listening to this guy speak. Oh, yeah. Because he speaks like a caricature of <laughs> William Shatner. <laughs> and it drives me nuts. <laughs> Fair enough. And this is how he speaks. And it's actually very Obama like, but it's not, it doesn't flow as well. It's just not good. And yeah. uh, it. <sighs> It, just, yeah. it gives me shivers every time I hear it. Yeah. Like a, it's it's like a bad William Shatner <laughs> caricature. Like anyway, so um, yeah, that's what he actually had to say. Is like what a great opportunity this is uh, for <laughs> Americans to sell more oil to Europe and get them away from um, being reliant on the Russians. Wow, that's just that blows my mind. <laughs> How lucky we are that this brazen terrorist attack on an ally's critical infrastructure occurred. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, uh, I don't know. I mean, what can you even say about that? Like, this is this is America's chief diplomat. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Selling oil. <laughs> mm -hmm. America's chief diplomat. That's what he had to say about it. So, uh, that's... I, I hope that if you have any doubts... Um, or, or if you believe that I'm just like spouting conspiracy theories, baseless conspiracy theories, that this at least provides some base. Yeah, exactly. They're not baseless. Yeah. <laughs> they may still be conspiracy theories, but... Yeah, well, depending on who you ask, I suppose. Yeah, right. <laughs> conspiracy is based on perspective, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, as for Germany in this, this is the thing, and this is why... Um, why we better all hope actually that it never comes out that you, the U S is responsible for this. Yeah. Um, is that, uh, now and Germany's done a lot of this to themselves. Um, but Germany has essentially cut its own legs off through all of this. Yeah. Um, Angela Merkel, whatever you have to say about her, um, was at least foresighted enough to, uh, to begin the construction on this. Like she was in, in control of Germany when these pipelines, um, were constructed or the beginnings of construction. Yeah. Um, she saw the, the need that Germany has for cheap Russian energy to, to fuel its industry. Yeah. Um, the guy that's there now, Olaf Scholz is a moron. <laughs> and he immediately kowtowed to the American pressure. Yeah. Uh, he never turned on the Nord Stream two pipeline. Um, his, uh, the Germany has, destroyed itself as a state or at least as a state with any kind of, of economic economic power. Yeah. Um, because they, they can't maintain their industry without the cheap Russian energy. Yeah. The, uh, you know, the Americans may be able to provide additional energy, um, you know, to, to kind of supplement, but not at the same price. Yeah. I was going to say, it ain't going to be cheap. And, um, and so like decisions have to be made. Yeah. Like this is where the market starts playing into this and, and, um, you know, allocation of resource, uh, starts to be restricted, yeah. um, because of the cost. And of course, you know, the low energy allowed their products to be lower cost. Now higher energy cost means higher cost of the product. Yeah. Um, and that they're not going to be able to compete at the same level. But what's happening right now is that industries are actually shutting down. Like lots of industries are shutting down in Germany. Yeah. And so people are being unemployed. Yeah, I was going to say. Disemployed, de-employed, whatever. Yeah. Uh, not deployed, although yeah. that might happen that, soon. That's, that's the next step. <laughs> right. Um, and uh, like this is a real problem. Like you, the, the country is going to become far more impoverished. Yeah. Like there's going to be widespread poverty in Germany as a result of all this. Uh, and... The other problem, obviously, is that there, there's going to be widespread poverty going into winter in Germany. Um, Firewood not, is going to be in demand. Yeah, it already is, apparently. I mean, yeah, they keep talking about firewood as being worth gold yeah. um, in Germany now. And, uh, you know, people fleeing the cities to their um, relatives in the country where they can cut down wood. And, uh, I mean, we'll see what happens, but I'm... I'm afraid that it's what you're going to see, start. yeah, I, I'm afraid that what you're going to see through the winter here 
in Germany is that you're going to see uh, quite a bit of uh, starvation and um, freezing. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a first Which, world country. This is a highly developed country that never could have seen itself these, in this yeah, position. These, these energy problems shouldn't exist. Yeah. Right? Well, and the other thing is that they, they shot themselves in the foot with their green energy um, promotion. Uh, they shut down their nuclear program. Yeah. Um, which could have supplied energy to the country through all this. Yeah. And uh, it'll take it'll take years to get that back online. Yeah. I mean, you can't, you don't... It doesn't, it's not like flipping a switch. Yeah, yeah, you don't just turn it back on. Yeah. Um, it takes a couple of years uh, to get back up to full production, and they, they don't have that kind of time. Um, yeah. I mean, it's October. They got months. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, this is a real problem for them. And this doesn't seem to be something that's going to end anytime soon. Uh, Zelensky just um, this week signed a decree uh, stating that they would not, absolutely not negotiate with Russia until Putin is replaced, which is, of course, totally in line with the Biden administration's stated desires about Russia, is that Putin has to be it's, it's, eliminated. It's the regime change. Yeah. Tac- or, yeah. Yeah. Tactic. Yeah. Um, now, <laughs> Russia responded in kind and yeah. said, oh, well, I guess we'll just have to wait until somebody else takes control of Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> right. To negotiate. Well, and that's more likely, in my mind at least, than, than Putin, something happening with Putin. Yeah. Um, I mean, it I, seems I to me the... like Ukraine would be the flimsy government here. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that you're probably right. Um, I, I don't know what the morale in Ukraine is like through all of this. No. Uh, I'm sure that it's been increased well, by their recent apparent military successes. And, and any time you have a situation like this, there's always a rally around the flag. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm sure they're experiencing a lot of that now. I mean, the news would tell me that they're experiencing a lot of that now. Now, how much I trust that is in question. Yeah. Um, now, it, it also at the beginning of this week, uh, Putin signed the... Um, whatever necessary legislation to incorporate the four regions uh, that had their um, their referendums last week. Which Ukraine has since taken some of back. Am yeah. I? yeah. <laughs> um, but Russia now sees it as uh, an attack on, an attack on sovereign territory. Yeah. yeah. Their yeah. sovereign territory. Um, now, they did say that, um, that the uh, Kherson and Zaporizhia uh, regions would be... Um, would actually be Russian territory um, and that they were going to maintain uh, the Donbass regions, the Donetsk and Luhansk as independent republics allied oh, really? with Russia. Yeah. Um, it, that's my understanding of how this is supposed to work. Yeah. Uh, but also when they were saying that they would just have to wait until, uh, you know, a smarter person took over Ukraine that would be willing to negotiate. Um, they did also say that the, the future of these four territories is not negotiable. Yeah. At this point. And it's, you know, once again, it's a real shame because in April they had the outline of a good deal. Yeah. Um, where uh, Crimea would have become Russian. The Donbass republics would have become independent uh, officially, as I understand. I mean, I don't know exactly what was into the deal, but I I know what Putin was asking for at the time. Yeah. And, um, and the, the, you know, that would have been the end of it. Yeah. But um, Boris Johnson went over there after... Uh, you know, while these negotiations were going on, talked to Zelensky and told him, we're not ready for you to sign a deal. Don't sign a deal. Yeah. And then he, they backed out. Yeah. Um, and of course, the, you know, the the um, President Putin and the Russian press is reporting this as uh, American interference, that, uh, you know, that, uh, that America, um, uh, I guess, is, is submarined those uh, discussions. Oh, yeah. 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 And he's probably right. Yeah. Um, and as a result, uh, people are going to die in Germany, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. No, this is a mess for everybody. Like yeah, but now they're in much worse worse position. I mean, uh, you know, chances are that, um, that Russia will turn Ukraine into a landlocked country. And you can see the territorial gains that Ukraine has gotten. But yeah. they're losing far more than Russia is. And yeah. Russia has more in reserve. Oh, yeah. Russia just has more military power, even with all the West is pumping into Ukraine. Yeah. And um, while they they seem to have had some real military successes attacking uh, lightly defended areas, um, I, I just think that as Russia, like, 
Russia can win the long game here. Yes. I think that's really what it kind of boils down to, Mm -hmm. is Russia just has the military wherewithal to just keep on and keep on and keep on. And you have to wonder, I mean, this would well have been over had the U.S. not been pumping money into Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Um, Oh, yeah. So, I mean, how long can And the equipment. Well, and that's the thing. Um, So how long can this really continue? Um, I, I just, I don't see... Uh, at some point, I mean, the U.S. probably doesn't mind pumping money in there as long as they need to. But at some point, the Ukraine, Ukrainian people are going to have enough. Well, at some point, Ukraine's going to run out of fighting age males. That too. Yeah. Um, because uh, they estimate that something like 750,000 Ukrainians um, are capable of fighting yeah. in this. And that Russia has somehow put out a commission um, through either uh, deaths or injuries, severe injuries. Yeah. About half a million of them. Wow. So like two thirds of their available military is probably already out of commission. Wow. So, at, of their manpower. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, it's hard to know, like this is all fog of war stuff. So yeah, it's hard to know for sure, but, um, it's not a good sign. Yeah. It, it just means that in the attrition game, Russia's yeah. winning. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and Russia hasn't even like really committed to this war as far as I can tell. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they may have now, although they don't have troops in place yet, but the, you know, with this uh, partial mobilization. Yeah. And there's even some talk out there that maybe, um, maybe they gave up this territory, gave up ground uh, to put themselves in a political position where it was easier to do this mobilization. Oh, really? That if they showed some defeats on the battlefield, that the people of Russia my, my would get behind, like, like behind. wait, yeah, rally yeah. behind the flag and say, no, yeah. no, we can't be defeated by Ukraine. Like, yeah. do what you have to do to win this thing. Yeah. Um, instead of being generally disinterested. Well, and I mean, I don't know a whole lot about Russian politics and whatnot, but I think my understanding is, is like, the, as far as like the Russian people are concerned, like those areas the Russian people are pretty happy with taking in. And oh, I, yeah. I mean, because they're basically ethnically Russian anyway, mm-hmm. right? Yes. So, I mean, the the fact that Ukraine has taken these areas back, that could be a, a ploy that works. Yeah. Um, and, yes, that, that's certainly... Uh, that's probably why Putin really got involved in the first place, yeah. why Russia got involved in the first place, is because there was internal pressure. Like, you can't just let the Ukrainian government continue to, um, you know, launch artillery strikes on our people yeah. there in the Donbass. Exactly. And and that's why it happened in the first place. Like, he couldn't allow the the Russian people in the Donbass to just be overwhelmed by the Ukrainian government. To just continue to suffer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because that would have been very bad politically for him. So, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, uh... I think that Russia has the capability of ending this very quickly. The question is, um, you know, whether, like, what's the level of force that they can apply that will prevent the West from being actively involved, like, yeah. more than they already are? Yeah. Um, well, and that's a danger everywhere. And and I hope that everybody recognizes that. I mean, like, both sides recognize that. Yeah. Um, while the the Pentagon has more or less dismissed the uh, possibility of this going nuclear. Like, yeah. ah, well, that's not likely to happen. Um, Biden, you know, crazy old Biden, um, did say something like that we're facing Armageddon uh, yeah. just recently. Yeah. So um, at least I think that he recognizes the possibility. Like, maybe it'll get enough people talking. And to me, you know, the question, like, that's not really the question. Like, okay. I agree that there's a very small chance that this thing goes nuclear. Yeah. But how much of a chance are you willing to take yeah. on the end of civilization in the Northern Hemisphere? Yeah. Like, how much How much of a chance is, are you willing to, to put on that? Uh, let's say it's 1%. Are yeah. you willing to take a 1 in 100 chance that, that both of these societies are wiped out and that most of life in the Northern Hemisphere is? Yeah. I mean, to me, anything greater than zero is more than <laughs> exactly. is more chance than you should take. Yeah, which is actually why I advocate the elimination of nuclear weapons entirely. As long as they're there, that's greater than a zero percent chance. Oh, absolutely. But we're certainly pushing into a into a situation where it's becoming more and more likely. Um, now, Russia has, even though there's all this talk about how Russia has threatened nuclear um, nuclear strikes. 
They haven't exactly. Yeah. Um, they've they've not explicitly. not explicitly said that. Yeah. Um, they have said uh, the only time when Putin was talking about this stuff, the only time he talked he said nuclear was when he was talking about nuclear threats from the West. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, now he did say uh, we have new and advanced kind of weapons, and we're willing to use everything available to us to defend our territory. Now, that's implicitly saying that he can use nuclear weapons, but um, the uh, the Russian Federation does have rules about when nuclear weapons can be used. Yeah. Um, and they are, if uh, nuclear, biological, or chemical weapons are used against them, yeah. um, or if there is a conventional uh, weapon attack that actually threatens the existence of the Russian state. Gotcha. Okay. Those are the two situations where their laws permit oh, them wow. to use nuclear weapons. Now the U S so that also, um, Russia has mostly been on board with the no first use policy. Yeah. The U S never has. Yeah. Um, to me, it seems more likely that the U S will use nuclear weapons before Russia will. Yeah. Um, and Zelensky is actually pushing for a nuclear first strike against Russia. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully people ignore him for the crazy cokehead that he is. But no. um, I don't know that for sure either. Those just rumors again. <laughs> but uh, it, it's it when seems, I watch him, <laughs> yeah. I, I can all, see it. See all the telltale signs. Yeah, I can see it. <laughs> um, and then there are new uh, sanctions that have been enacted by uh, Europe. Um, Actually, let's let's talk about a couple of things here. This is actually starting to run long. We're never going to get to our second topic, <laughs> but um, but this is important, I, I think. Um, first off, this world against Russia thing is a lie. Yeah, the world is not against Russia. Um, Europe, the U.S., and Canada, Japan, and Australia are against Russia. Yeah, representing roughly a quarter of the nations in the world. Okay. The rest of the world is not on board with this. Yeah. Um, including some close allies of ours, like Mexico, who's yeah. remained neutral. Yeah. Um, and the two most populous countries in the world have remained neutral in this, China and India. Yeah. Uh, they're not all applying the sanctions. Like, the, yeah. the sanctions are being applied by roughly 40 of the 190, however many, 196, 193, yeah. something, nations. Yeah. And the rest of the world, Africa, uh, the majority of Asia, uh, South America and Central America, they're not they're not doing this. Yeah. They're not with it. They're more concerned about their people and their um, economic livelihoods than punishing the Russians. Yeah. For right or wrong. Yeah. And punishing in a way that hasn't done, it's not working. <laughs> Like that's that's the other thing. Like these sanctions haven't stopped this war. Yeah, and they've actually had far more of an impact on the West than they have on Russia. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that that everybody else sees the attempt at this economic isolation and this economic war against Russia, um, and the the weaponization of the global financial system that the U.S. essentially controls. Um, and Russia has pointed out, I mean, like this is, I mean, this may be propaganda, but it's good propaganda if it is. Yeah. Um, you know, Russia has pointed out uh, that, hey, you could be next. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and they're not wrong about that. Like, no, I, I think that this is, this is actually a good point. So yeah. there is a real legitimate fear through what they call the global south yeah. um, of uh, the U.S.'s or, or an overpowerful West weaponizing the financial system to crush your country. Yeah. yeah. And so that makes people reluctant to get on board with this too, because yeah. they don't want to use it against them in the future. It incentivizes the creation of a, of a parallel um, financial economic system among the rest of the countries in the world. Yeah. Which wouldn't be good for the U S dollar, by the way. Yeah. Um, because that's essentially what props up the U S dollar at this point. Yeah. Um, and then there have been a new uh, round of sanctions passed by the EU uh, trying to do this price cap thing on Russian oil. Um, now, there were some countries that were holding it up. I, I think chief among them was Greece, who does a lot of transport of Russian oil. 
and makes money doing that. Yeah, <laughs> and um, and so there were some concessions made to Greece, but with the caveat that they had to enforce the price caps. But then Russia said, "We're not dealing with anybody that's that's enforcing the price caps." Yeah. Um, and I promise there are plenty of other countries that would be happy to step in for Greece and transport Russian oil yeah. without price caps. India and China are too. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, you know, like Greece hasn't been entirely stable economically for a long time, and this could be like a real impact a on their total economy yeah. too. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I don't know. The The Europeans don't seem to to realize that these sanctions regimes are actually not having a huge impact on the Russian economy, but they are having a huge impact on the European economy. Yeah. Um, and um, But it, it does seem that the European people are seeing this. Oh, yeah. And so there's like protests arising kind of all over. Yeah, which goes back to something I said before. I mean, this does kind of create a dangerous situation, especially with what some of the new leadership may look like in some of those EU countries. Yeah, and you are, you've already seen it with uh, Giorgio Maloney. Exactly. Um, now, Giorgio Maloney did put out a tweet, like in the last couple of days, saying, we're behind you, Ukraine, whatever you need from us, or whatever. So they're taking the same kind of foreign policy line that the previous regime did yeah. um, in Italy. But, uh, but yeah, yeah I, you will, I mean... I think that these the, things swing. Yeah, I think the right wing reaction is probably more to the COVID stuff than it is to the sanctions. But right now, yeah, but sanctions can definitely be. Yeah, I mean, a when you start this. feeling some of the impacts of some of that stuff, it can mm -hmm. it it changes the way people vote, man. Yeah, um, I was listening to Jimmy Dore the other day talking about uh, Giorgio Maloney, and he said, you know, like people are are up in arms about this right wing, um, you know. Uh, Hard right wing um, new prime minister. Yeah, well, I mean, he was making fun of that, but because yeah. um, he's got some sense. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, that's good to know. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, this uh, hard right wing new prime minister of Italy, and um, and he was saying, well, you know, this could have been avoided if there had been a left wing politician that stood up to the the to the COVID regime, yeah. because what really kind of launched Giorgia Maloney into the public spotlight. Um, and, and garnered a lot of support for her is that she was one of very, very few Italian politicians that were standing up against the COVID passport stuff and all the lockdowns and things. Yeah. Um, uh, and the, you know, various restrictions, like she was opposed to the, the crazy COVID regime yeah. and she was one of very, very few. And he said, this could have been easily avoided if a left wing politician had been doing the had same done thing. The same. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, but that, yeah, that's not where we are. No. Yeah. And, you know, to me, left-wing authoritarianism, right-wing authoritarianism, I don't really care. Yeah. Like, they're both a problem as far I as I'm concerned. Say, it doesn't matter. I don't want to live under either. So. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't matter whether it's left-wing or right-wing. Authoritarianism is the problem. Exactly. So. Um, and, you know, it doesn't seem to matter which, which, of the par which of the major parties is in control of this country. Yeah, which boot is on your neck, the right or the left? It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, exactly. Yeah. Um, that's all I have, and we're already like Good. pushing late. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, we could so, run really long like we have been, but I'm really trying to get this back to around 50 minutes. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not gonna lie, I'm kind of gassed. So we'll save. We got some stuff for next week then. Yeah, um, I was gonna talk about the COVID vaccines again because like we're starting to get some real statistics on excess deaths and and so forth. Yeah. Um, although they are hard to find. <laughs> yeah, I bet they are. Uh, but I I did want to talk about that because I think it's important for people to know that the you know that you're better off without getting the vaccine Yeah. at, at this point. Like, you're more likely to live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that seems to be what the data is pointing to, so... Um, you, mean, you mean you're following the science? It depends on who's defining that, I suppose. <laughs> like, you know, this is one of those very effective propaganda tactics, yeah. um, is that, you know, to place it in the power of some kind of authority on the subject that can't be questioned. Yeah. Um, and it's especially good when it's something like, um, that not a lot of people understand anyway. Well, I was going to say something that's not concrete. 
Yeah, yeah. You know, like the science. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know. Anyway, um, but we can get back into that. I certainly have plenty of things to say about science. Okay. So, um, well, I'll, I'll say that. We'll say that for next time and just kind of wrap it up here and say that it was really just a podcast about um, pipelines and war prospects and yeah. boots on necks. Boots on necks. Yeah. That's what we're trying to avoid here. Yeah. <laughs> um, and hopefully this helped. So uh, things are really picking up in my office, by the way. Yeah. So um, next week, Next week and the week after will be kind of iffy. Like, okay. I, I imagine that I'm going to miss one of those two. Okay. Um, we'll have to see. I mean, like, hopefully we can keep it under control. Yeah. But, uh, but we're seeing more work than, than we were told to expect. Oh, yeah. So. Which, while is a good thing, is not good for the podcast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, so, you know, after um, Harvey Irma that year. Yeah. I worked... Every single day from the last, um, the last like week and a half of August until Thanksgiving. Wow. And, um, and it was mostly like, like averaging around 12 hour days, seven Ooh. days a week for two months. <laughs> yeah. No, that ain't good two for and, nobody, man. Yeah. Two and a half months, I guess. Yeah. It's not healthy. Um, no. No, I was definitely dragging <laughs> by the <laughs> yeah. end of all that. Um, but I, I don't expect that this one. I mean, this, yeah. you know, that was two huge storms yeah. on the heels of each other and in very different locations. So we were also having to manage two, two different, two areas. completely separate events. I mean, they were yeah. like completely separate events with different crews on both sides both and sides. so forth. So that made it, that made it more difficult. Yeah. Um, and we're just we're just more streamlined now than we were then. Technology's came a long way. Uh, it's more like you know lessons learned every time. Oh uh, yeah. You know you just kind of get better at it. Like all right, well we tried something new then. We probably handled that better than the previous um, big catastrophe event that we uh, dealt with, and um, and then we learned stuff from that, and we're we'll handle this one better than that one. Yeah. And we'll learn stuff from this one and handle the next one even better. It, so it gets better every time. Yep, yep. And better we have a, we have a good group of people, and it's yeah. it's essentially hey, that, the same group of people. Hey, that makes that that makes or breaks you, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, been in leadership long enough to know that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that there's only one person that's new since then. Yeah. So I think everybody else in the office, all but one person in our office, was there for the Harvey Irma. Oh, wow. stuff so. so yeah you're, you're sitting in pretty good shape then yeah y'all will be all right yeah we'll be fine but <laughs> it could still get really busy for a little bit okay um because it's just got to get done and well, either it way. comes fast well we'll try to get together yeah um i i don't think that there's any way that i miss both but i i think that there's a possibility that i miss one okay so um i just want to prepare people i don't want to get everybody's <laughs> hopes up and then not show up yeah, yeah. i'd rather enough. have you Think I'm not going to show up and then show up anyway. Well, if if it does look like we're going to go a week without one, I'll try to do my part and put something on the Facebook page so okay. people don't worry about us. Okay. Yep. Cool. So. Sounds good. Um. All right. I'm heading to New Orleans tomorrow. Ah, fun. Yep. Only for the day. Business or pleasure? Pleasure. Um. Uh, I'm. Mom and I are meeting uh, my sister-in-law for lunch. Ah. She's in town for a wedding or something. Should be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And I'll buy some booze while I'm there. Cheap booze. Cheaper, anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but we, we plan, at this point, to be back next week. Um, in the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook. Uh, you can subscribe on iTunes, Podbean, or YouTube, and or YouTube. Um, like and share, comment, um, tell your friends, uh, write reviews, I don't know, whatever else. Yeah. There's other things. Like all those things that you can do to, to get us circulating a little better. Every little bit helps. And we really appreciate it. Absolutely. And uh, we'll be back next week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life's short, live free. Ciao. Later.